All right, welcome to lecture seven. Uh, this is uh, going to be week four. Now we are going to start applying what we learn in different example or environmental problems. For instance, this week we'll all discuss about surface water, uh, this today class, and next class we'll talk about groundwater quality. So we'll learn about those two water quality this week. So these are natural systems. We are not talking about engineer systems. And in the following weeks, we'll start discussing about engineer system where you actually change something um, and how we design them to remove uh, pollutant. Uh, so we don't really focus a lot on water qual quantity aspect, like how much water we have, how do we increase the amount of water availability, like snowfall, all that hydrological aspect a lot. Um, those are, uh, there are introduction to water resource engineering. There you learn about water quantity. So this class is mostly water quality. Quality means the, the contaminants, how do you make them clean? Um, some announcement, uh, homework three is uh, due um, end of this week, which is Friday. Um, again, uh, if you have any difficulties, any other issues, um, attend the uh, TS session, discussion sessions, as well as their, um, their, uh, their office hour. Obviously, you can ask me on campus where I, I noticed that there are a couple of questions in the weekend. I have not gone to that yet. I will respond today. And also check sometimes, you know, you may be asking something that already people have uh, asked. Uh, so it's always a good idea to just check if there is anything similar question asked before. And I also noticed that some students have difficulty downloading homework. Um, I thought I sent email. And the homework, usually all the homeworks, I send them also by email. So you should have those in your email ID. You, know, you can check the one you register on CCLE. And usually when I send as an attachment, you should be receiving those uh, as well. Obviously, I'll, I'll also upload on campus where just in case uh, CCLE is down. Um, again, today we'll discuss about chapter five. And all I need to uh, read is section four to six. Okay, so that's basically surface water, uh, river, not lake, um, because we are not going to have enough time to discuss about lake. But it's interesting if you want to interest, uh, want to learn more about lake, now there's section number seven, that's something you can read. Uh, but for this class, we'll not have time uh, to go through everything. So again, section four to six, uh, page 196 to 218, that's all I want you guys to read. Uh, so that's in chapter five, that's pertaining to this today's lecture. Um, one thing I want to say that last lectures I messed up um, uh, about re uh, risk calculations, the formula and all that. I don't uh, work on this one a lot, so I didn't memorize all these things, you know, so I, I messed up last class. So when I calculate, I calculate A by C as a relative risk. I didn't even remember what is attributable risk uh, look like, you know. So, I um, I thought I'll uh, write those in the lecture. So I thought um, it's better to announce in this class so that it's part of the recording. Uh, so again, go back. This is just a you know, formula that you can use to calculate this relative risk, attributable risk, and or ratio. The reason you want to know all these three different is if you are working on on a risk assessment. Uh, different people use different terms. Some people use relative risk, some people use attributable risk. So you just have to know just that these exist, you know, there is a number that you can calculate. Uh, so again, go back, you know, just anytime somebody asks the questions like this on, 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 a, on a quiz or it's midterms, you just have to go back to this formula and apply that. Okay, so um, this is um, not the right, keyword. Uh, so today we are going to learn about uh, obviously two things. First, we'll discuss about the quiz one, uh, what we lesson learn, what lessons I learn based on the uh, some online quiz, because it's something uh, I did last year, but last year didn't, we didn't have this much, some issues like we have faced this year. Um, there are also issues related to um, um, I'll get to that, um, but I'll discuss about the solutions. Um, if you have specific questions or concern, you can email me. Uh, I know that some of some of you email. Now we'll, I'll respond to those um, soon. 
And overall, the, the learning objective of this class is uh, uh, understanding surface water quality. Mostly we'll discuss everything. When we think of water quality, obviously it's all what makes the uh, water unclean. There are lots of stuff, you know, but we're not going to discuss all of them because we, we have already understood you now some of them before. Metals, all those different types of pollutants. But what we are going to discuss today in great depth is a biologic, biochemical oxygen demand. So you learn what does that mean, how to apply those uh, to actually solve the problem. So that's one thing that we'll learn a lot today. Okay, so quiz one. Quiz one results, uh, this is from CCLE, I directly put it. I noticed that not 208 students appear the quiz. Um, as of today, the total students is 210, so two students didn't appear the exams. Um, if you are one of them, uh, uh, email me, uh, reach out to me because I wanted to know uh, what went wrong. Because uh, not attending is always uh, is always going to influence your grade more than attending because uh, zero is always worse. Uh, but again, I wanted to be aware of you know if there is any difficulties you know you have faced health issue all that, uh, let me know. <clears throat> and the average grade, if you see, eighty six point one five, close to ninety percent. Uh, if you think of median, that's a 90%. Uh, so nine out of 10 is median grade. So that means 50% of the students uh, have a 90 or ever percentage. Standard deviation is a 12.73. Those are all the point. What I want to get out is uh, most of you did very well. Uh, and um, also I want to say that this is a one of the three quiz. And there are homeworks, there are uh, uh, midterms, there are finals. So even you did not do well, you can still get A because this is a very small percentage of the whole thing. So I hope that this is early enough for you to understand how the class, how to prepare for it. Um, and also, I also recognize that this is a 50% uh, of the quiz is also refresher about chemistry. So a lot of students may have difficulty there, but I don't think that will be an issue in the next quiz because those will be all basically what we cover here in this class. Um, so I think, you know, I would not dishearten if you are, uh, um, uh, if you receive uh, low points, because, you know, you always can make up uh, or you have still a sufficient amount of uh, points left for your entire year, rest of the quarters to, uh, to still get a or equivalent grade. So again, just the distributions, that's what I was, I was talking about. Now, most of the students, you know, as you see, this is the number of students. Um, you know, if you think of 63, around 60 students um, uh, got uh, between 9.9 9 to 10, uh, 120 students. Uh, and then there are occasional some students have uh, difficulties. Uh, again, as that's what I said, uh, um, just uh, try to uh, try to uh, do well in the next uh, homework squeeze on that. Homework, you have, uh, you have complete controls because you can always ask questions, you can always, um, uh, if you have difficulty in that week, you can uh, go to discussion sessions, all that. And also I wanna say that uh, some of you ask for extension. Uh, I never want to you know, uh, uh, be that as a problem. Uh, so always I encourage you to start working already, but I understand that you know, some weeks are harder uh, because of a lot of things that we have to deal with. So never stop asking for extension if you are one of those who has was really struggling for all these different reasons. Okay, so um, the format of the question might be different in the sense, you know, I didn't write options A, B, C here, uh, but I'll go through all the questions here. Okay. Um, the question first, so none of them actually have to do a lot of calculations. You know? There is one question, it looked like a lot of calculation here, number eight, but if you read the question, it does not require any calculations. So I'll go through that very quickly. The first question was oxidation state of sulfur in S2SO4 and SO4 2 minus. Uh, there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, the first thing to do is, uh, um, is to actually calculate oxidation state, uh, which is uh, obviously the most correct way. But there is also some educated guess that you can have, uh, which require you not to do any calculations. As you remember, S2SO4 and SO4, S2SO4 is. Um, um, it is as acid, now it goes further and SO4 minus two minus. So this kind of reaction when dissolved, it doesn't change the oxidation state. All it does is break into different 
molecules or elements that constitute that molecule. Uh, so that means, you know, if you see S2SO4 has sulfate. Um, so this is, I'm asking the same question. I'm just saying that, I know, think of your, uh, I say, you know, if you have a, if you have a one apple inside an orange, it doesn't change that it become orange. You know? So that's exactly what is here. It's mixed up in, in the molecule, but it still retain its oxidation state. Uh, so they are same, okay? So, so they are same, so that means it's, it's true. Um, but if you do calculate oxidation state of sulfur, which will be here, um, minus oxygen is minus two, so that will be minus eight. If you go to that side, so it will be plus six. So sulfur oxidation state is plus six. If you calculate both sides, you will also receive, you'll also see that it's same. But again, just to uh, idea, you know, you can find out. The second one, one mole uh, phosphoric acid is what normal phosphoric acid. You know that, um, as I say here, um, it, has a, it has a three charge, okay? And that means you can take three protons. Uh, so that means it is uh, three, three times more powerful as a simple uh, single charge. So usually N equal to three, so that you can write three here. Uh, denitrification, is, this reaction is oxidation or reductions. So obviously you can solve it as oxidation reduction state. Other times you can just see whether this the left side is receiving electrons or gaining electrons. The way to find out the oxidation state of nitrogen is a zero because in a two nitrogen, there is no charge. So two times zero must be zero. And if you think of this one, if you calculate oxidation state is um, oxygen is minus two, so if you just calculate that stage, it become plus five. So what you are seeing is nitrogen with a plus five oxidation state become zero. The only way plus five becomes zero is you add uh, some negative charge. Negative charge is basically electrons. So that means the left side must be receiving five electrons. If it is receiving five electrons, that's reductions, okay? But if you pay attention a lot of times, you know, in the class, denitrification, you see that equation there. It has electrons on the left side. You just note as soon as you notice it, you know that it's the reductions. So you would have also able to find that answer. The lead concentration in soil is 500 ppm. What would be that concentration in gram per ppb in kg kilogram of soil? So some students, you know, a few students uh, may have confusion about ppm equal to milligram per liters. Just know that that's a special case in water. But what is ppm means? It's a fraction, like percentage. Uh, it's a 10% of uh, something is something. It doesn't have to be liter. So what it means is you have 500 parts in 1 million of part of something. So 500 ppb of lead in 100 million part of, um, part of uh, this is in this case soil. Okay, so think of what is that uh, means, you know, you are measuring lead in um, whichever way you want to measure. So let's say the reason I ask here is gram per um, lead. Uh, so let's say this is, I put, if I say this is a, whatever unit you put, you have to put in the both side. Let's say I have put milligram, okay? 500 milligram of lead in one million milligram of soil. That's what it means. Or 500 grams of lead in 1 million grams of soil. So if you know this one, then you, all you have to do is calculate that in terms of gram. So same thing, another thing I would say, 500 gram of lead in 1 million, which is 10 to the 6 gram of uh, soil, okay? But I ask in 1 kg of soil. So you have to think what is the 1 kg means, you know? 1 kg is 1,000 gram. So if you see here, 500 gram per lead, this will be 10 to the three, and this is 10 to the three gram of soil. I just write it in a two different units so that I can say this is one kilogram, okay? So that means if you divide 500 by 1000, 10 to the three, this becomes 0.5 gram of lead in 
10 to the power 3 kg uh, gram of soil because I just calculate this here so that becomes 0 0.5 gram of lead in 10 to the 3 is uh, or 1000 gram of soil is same as 1 kg of soil So that means 0 0.5. So if you have this answer, uh, you would be getting the full points. The next question, half-life of a reaction is one hour. What is the rate constant assuming first order reactions? Uh, so that's uh, uh, the, the answer is 0 0.693 divided by uh, T half is uh, K. Okay. Uh, so this is 0 0.693. This will be one hour, so that becomes 0 0.693 hour inverse. So if you have this answer, because that's the right unit, uh, you'll get the full points. One liter water contains how many moles of water? So this is something I give multiple choice. I just wrote it here so that it becomes faster to see. So uh, let's write it here. I'm just going to write it here. So what I ask is, what's the mole of uh, water in one liter? Okay. So you know that uh, then one mole of water is. So if you do molecular weight, oxygen is 16 plus hydrogen is 2. So that will be 18 gram per mole. So that means one, if you take one mole of water, it weighs one, 18 gram. I ask what is the eight, one liter of water. So one liter of water, you just have to know how much weight it is. Uh, so that is given as a density. So if I write one liter of water, you know that one liter is a 1000 ml. And first you have to change volume to uh, mass, then to mole. Uh, you know that one ml of water is one gram of water. Okay. That's based on the density. And then if you, now uh, you have everything done, you just have to change mass to uh, mass to mole. So you know 18 gram of water is same as one mole of water, okay? So you have all the number. So that would be 1000 divided by 18. So that will be 55 point something five moles, okay? So it, as long as you chose that choice, you should be able to get that answer. All right, the next one is a mass balance equations. Assuming steady states, calculate the value here. So again, this is steady states. So that means everything coming in, um, Q in should be equal to Q out, okay? So as you see there are in, so this is in, this is in, this is in because arrow is pointing towards the system and um, these are out, this is out, okay? So that means if you write all the ins, so 10 plus seven plus two should be equal to all the out. So that will be Q plus five. So if you solve for Q, it would be 14 um, G gallon per minute, so. As long as you chose 14, you should get the full points. The, the question number eight, it's, it gives you a bunch of numbers. So let's read it. Contaminated water contains 10 milligrams per liter of PFAS has been dumped at rates of 10,000 liters per minute into a pond of certain volume for a long period of time to assume steady state. Steady state means things are not changing. The concentration is not changing. If PFAS is conservative chemicals, no degradations, no mass loss by any other processes, what is the outflow concentrations of PFAS? So think of what I'm asking here. I'm saying that there was a pond, doesn't matter what's the volume. I've been dumping water for a period of long, long time. So think of what will happen after a long time. There'll be no pond water left. Everything we're dumping is going to be the contaminated water. So that's the only source that's coming in, okay? So that means after a point, this is just uh, filled with a uh, contaminated water. That's, uh, that's the steady state. So what is the concentration in? It should be same as concentration out because there is no reaction, no dilution, nothing because all has been replaced. So the answer would be 10. So you don't really need to calculate anything. Uh, but if you 
do put the in the equations, you will still get the same answers. Because what you'll see is Q in, Q in, C in, this will be equal to Q out, C out. Okay, when you do this one, you, you know that there is only Q in, one flow coming in, and there is one flow going out, it's the same flow, so they cancel out. So C in, this will be C out, so that would be 10 milligram per liter. So even if you put the equation or everything, you will still get the same answers. The last one, uh, last two, uh, lake water is used to circulate around a turbine to keep it cooler and exchange the heat from the turbine. Assuming the temperature of warm water from the turbine is constant, the lake water temperature can fluctuate between the season when the efficiency of heat exchange is higher. So that's if you see that engine, you know, the, the glass we have, so, you have hot engine, hot, and then you have cold water. The work efficiency is basically one minus T, T cold by T hot, okay, uh, or the efficiency, okay. So what I'm asking here is that when the efficiency is high. Well, think of what is that efficiency it means is how much, ex at what point the exchange rate will be higher. So heat exchange the because of the difference in temperature. If you have higher gradients, think of you know it's the same as flow rate. If I ask you at what point you can draw, you can the water flow will be much higher as long as the difference is high, the water flow will be higher. The same thing here, as long as the difference in temperature is high, it will be it will be high efficient. Uh, so uh, hot water, as I said, warm water is always going to be constant. That's what you assume or is written here. The only thing that changes is the lake water temperature. So the lake water will be when this will be a lot colder is going to be the most efficient because the difference will be higher. So as long as you chose winter, you should get the full point. The last question is based on uh, energy. Uh, between ultraviolet and infrared lights, which one will travel a longer distance through fog? Um, again, the reason why something travel long distance is based on its wavelength or frequency most importantly. So the, the higher the frequency, it has more energy, it will more interact with the fog or things in the air and it will dissipate. So you want a low energetic um, light. Uh, so that means you know, if you know ultraviolet in the spectrum, the higher frequency is high. If the frequency is high, the distance travel will be low because it will deplete. And I ask when is the longer distance? You want higher distance. The frequency is low here, so distance would be high. So as long as you chose infrared, you should be able to receive full point. Okay, so that's all for the quiz. Any question? Okay, so 27 minutes gone for this lectures uh, discussing about other things. So let's get to the, um, I just want to say that we'll discuss about one concept. Uh, there are multiple examples. I may not solve everything. At the last part where we are going to calculate the concentrations of dissolved oxygen or deficit in a river water, um, that requires a lot of, um, 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 uh, that will require a lot of um, time to think about. Uh, because that takes a lot of multiple steps. So I don't think I'll finish that within one hour, the first half. So what I'll do is I will, um, I know, I'll let you read this one, uh, whatever we cover, at least the concept. And then for that particular problem, I'll record it uh, after this class and post it. So we don't have, that way we, I don't have to really rush through everything. So. The first thing is a uh, surface water quality, you know, if you think of the surface water quality, you know, that's the reason why the environmental engineering is developed. If you remember, if you solve this one, this, this particular river uh, uh, in, um, that catch fire, uh, is because lots of wastewater, industrial waste are being dumped under the, the water. And after a point, it was so toxic and so much biomass that it, it catch fire, then it's like just lot of, lots of fuel. So the, you see water is burning. And so that's why you know, if you, there are many, many instances where the surface water is so polluted that the fish dies 
um, not just freestyle. So it's just uh, nothing can be done. It's like dead lakes or dead rivers. So that's the reason EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, was formed. That's the reason Clean Water Act was uh, 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 was uh, passed. What does that means? You cannot dump all this waste, particularly wastewater, into the rivers without treating them. That's the reason why we designed the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so if you see most of the reason why this, you know, we take care of surface water is because of the waste that coming off wastewater treatment plant. And uh, what comes from wastewater treatment plants is basically organic rich water. And that organic rich water can do lots of damage. For instance, it can lower the oxygen concentrations. It's like you are putting so much food in water that the bacteria will go crazy and they will they breathe in the oxygen and break the organic carbon like we do, breathe in oxygen, break out the food. And in the process, they will deplete the oxygen concentration in water. And if there is no oxygen, fish can't breathe, they will die. A lot of things will happen like that, it will stink. So what we're gonna to learn today in this class is about how to restore the dissolved oxygen concentrations when you have lots of this organic. Um, now question is, you know, why this particular organic things we are looking at? Uh, well, that's just part of this class. There are lots of different pollutants. Uh, nevertheless, you know, heavy metals is one of the pollutants. If you have lots of heavy metals, there will be chronic toxicity. Um, if you have lots of nutrients, uh, that will have also eutrophications other uh, aspect, which is similar to also dissolved oxygen depletation, depletions. Um, but for the sake of this class, so just learn the concept, we'll just focus on organic as a BOD or something that we want. Um, just for sake of it, now there are different types of pollutants. Uh, when you think of as engineer um, or scientist, we are always interested in how to remain or how to remove those pollutants. The way to remove pollutant is to understand where they're coming from. If you know where they're coming from, we can actually make the design at the source. Uh, so the engineering solution is two types based on the source. So the, there are two types of source. One is a point source. Point source means you know exactly the discharge point. For instance, wastewater treatment plants is a point source. Septic tank is a point source. That means that's the location of the cause of concern. So as long as you fix the problem there, it will be okay. Whereas non-point source, that means you cannot pinpoint where the source of pollutants are, it is dispersed. Uh, so for instance, uh, storm water or urban runoff or agriculture runoff, they're coming from different fields. So you really can say, okay, this is the location. Uh, so non-point source is dispersed. So that means you cannot um, design a centralized systems like wastewater treatment plants uh, because you don't know where they're coming from. So there will be lots of different places you have to design. Uh, so that's why non-point source pollutions, you can't treat the same way, engineering way, the way you do point source. Um, so that's just the concept, how you design it. So non-point source, again, is mostly runoff or storm water. And this is the reason we design green infrastructures. Basically, uh, putting a pond somewhere, putting bioswell somewhere, design the side of road different ways. Uh, so these are different things we do. And for point source, you design engineering system like wastewater treatment plant. Okay, that's because you know all the swear or the all the uh, waste that we generate at the household scale is all being transported to one location. So that's where we uh, we treat them. Uh, so that's just the based on how our approach would be, uh, how our approach to solve this problem. But in terms of pollutant types, uh, when you design different system, you have to also know what types of pollutants they are. As I said, we talk about heavy metals, all that. Those are based on characteristic. But when it comes to design, it doesn't really matter those things. You know, there are a lot of other factors you have to force. The first thing you have to do is let's say you have a pollutant. The first thing you have to think is this particulate or is this not? Is this particulate because or dissolve? The reason is if it is particles, it's very easy to remove it. You can either filter it, just have to decide the what's the strain size so that you can put that strain or filters and then everything stuck on the surface uh, and the water will flow through it. 
uh, of it is particulate, so you can settle them based on different design. So your design will be very different. It's the dissolved one, which is very difficult to remove by filtrations. So that means you have to think of something more than that. And so what is decided by dissolve? Well, dissolve means, true dissolve means it's not really having any shape, okay? Um, particulate has a shape, you know, it's a sphere, you know, you can see them uh, under a microscope or um, uh, uh, like a, if it is true nanoparticles, uh, you can see them under electron microscope. Uh, so, but anyway, these are particulates, you know, the fine particulates, anything above one nanometers is considered particulates because there are some molecules which has a small, like a, also on the range of nanometers, but we still don't consider them as particulates. Um, but by true definition, one nanometers. But for engineers, you know, they, in, when you go on outside to calculate all these things, it's very difficult to filter water with a one nanometer screen, because if, first of all, there is no screen that is one nanometers. You can't design a screen that has this whole one nanometers and you, Push through that. Uh, so normally, what its operational definitions? People do have filter size around 0.45 microns, and that's the time. The reason people use 0.45 micron is that that's the size, that's the minimum size of bacteria. If you think of bacteria size, they can be one half micrometer. This size, this is two micrometers. At that time, when people are deciding what is dissolved or not, they just don't want bacteria. That's what they thought particulate. There's nothing else they think of. Uh, so they want to filter them out. Uh, so that's why they decide 0.45 micron is the boundary where you decide what is dissolved versus particulate. So when you think of this class, just think in this context. It's operational definitions. Uh, the, anything below 0.45 is considered dissolved. Um, anything above that one is considered particulate. But really, you know, if you think about its particulates, you can go as low as one nanometers. And then once you know by, by shape or size, then you have to think of, um, this is 0 0.45 micrometers. And then you have to show what kind of characteristic. Is this inorganic? Or is this is organic? Or is this something else, you know, like, uh, uh, dissolved gas or something. So if it is inorganic, you, there are many things, it's the heavy metals. Uh, you have uh, also salt or ions. Uh, salt. Um, ions and then you have, uh, uh, if you think of uh, nitrate is a uh, nutrients, phosphate uh, and ammonium, these are inorganic. Um, and then if you think of organic, that's basically hydrocarbons. Uh, so all the things, pesticide, herbicide, all that. Uh, PFAS, you know, PFAS is organic. Basically hydrocarbons, all that stuff. Um, what we discussed today is, uh, is mostly the nutrients as well as organic, how to remove them, because that's the one consume, uh, they can actually dep deplete oxygen in water. So uh, having said all that, you know, if you know these are the different types of pollutant, one thing I didn't really mention, the particulates are pathogens. I say indirectly, but just want to clarify. Uh, bacteria, viruses, nanoparticles, all that, okay? Um, if you want to know which one we should care about, well, uh, these are the surveys that EPA did in 2002, uh, or 2000 actually, and they published in 2002, and they found that uh, the percentage of different systems that is being kind of the surface water, let's like say lake and rivers, how much percentage of that lake water, river water is polluted. You see the by far the most important pollutants that something that cause the, um, the impaired is uh, the pathogens. And then the second one is, uh, let me see what I wrote here. This what is, Okay, if you see the pathogens, the by far 35% is polluted. Uh, siltation, that's basically small fine particulates or suspended solid. Habitat alterations, oxygen depleting substance. This is what we are going to, to work today, okay? So what is oxygen depleting substance? That could be organic, that could be nit nitrite, 
that could be nitrate uh, because this react with oxygen and form oxidized products for instance organic become co2 this become nitrate or nitrogen gas whichever way you want to say this become nitrate okay so either way you see this we consume oxygen the reason it consume oxygen is because of the inherent chemical reactions and the effect is freestyle so that's why all the time we're interested in oxygen depleting substance and we are going to uh, do that work today um, yes ns3 is ammonia oh, why is that uh, i should write there is no charge here okay ammonium is ammonium so and that can become ns3 which is a gas and s plus um, so when you think of nutrients, there could be organic nutrients, all that stuff. So it's written here. Okay, and thermal modification means temperatures, because you have urban water. So a lot of times the concrete heat of the water, the average temperatures of uh, of uh, the streams uh, increases, and that the temperature may not be feasible for many fish. So you look at temperatures as another um, pollutants. Then metals. Then you also have fluoride. And if you see the major source of pollutions, agriculture by far is the most biggest source of pollutions. Then you see the hydrologic modifications because of uh, urban areas, all that stuff. Um, and then these are all different stuff you can see. So these are all background. And now we have to go to very specific about dissolved oxygen because that's the one we'll focus rest of the class today. Any question before we go, go to that? Again, you'll use mass balance, you use redox or chemistry that you already knew. So now it's all about applying those to solve this problem. Okay, so how do assess surface water quality? As I mentioned, there are many different types of pollutants. If your goal is to find everything in the system, if impossible, because you can't detect everything, it's just so much work. Uh, so most of the time people look for what is the most important criteria. And so they come up with these ideas that says, well, uh, we can detect every type of organics, uh, but what we could do is we could see the effect. Instead of looking for the cause, let's look for the effect. So the here effect is dissolved oxygen depletions because you know that fish will die if you don't have enough oxygen. So instead of looking for what caused the dissolved oxygen, let's look for the effect. How much dissolved oxygen is there? And then we infer that back to the to the condition and say must be there are lots of dissolved oxygen consuming uh, substance. Uh, so that's the whole idea of this class or this particular concept. Uh, so a lot of time, all they measure is oxygen demand. And again, oxygen demand means not oxygen. That's the clear things I want to mention. Oxygen demand means the chemicals that consume oxygen that I just mentioned. So it's just polar opposite. It's the same thing as think of, um, during COVID time, we have lots of demand for uh, paper towels or, uh, or uh, yes, paper towel. So in Costco or all the market, the things are gone. So if you think of how much paper towel in the lake, uh, in the store, very small because the demand is high. So demand is opposite to actual what you are measuring. Okay, It's up inversely proportional. So if you have more demand, most likely you'll find less of that substance in the market. The same way for here. If you have more oxygen demand, that means you have actual dissolved oxygen will be very small because they are all been taken up. Okay. So oxygen demand, every time you see oxygen demand, think chemicals that consume oxygen. Okay. And when you think of oxygen or dissolved oxygen, that is actual amount of oxygen in the water. So again, DO is dissolved oxygen. OD is oxygen demand, okay? Oxygen demand is basically chemic chemicals or substance that consumes or that makes the bacteria consume 
dissolve oxygen. So that's the clear differences. And those chemicals that consume oxygen could be many organics, like I said. So, and so that means if the organic carbon is the reason why the oxygen content is decreasing, it's called carbonaceous oxygen demand. If the reason of oxygen depletion is because of ammonia or nitrogen compounds, that's because nitrogenous oxygen demand. So it's based on what reaction it is. As I mentioned here, um, somewhere I mentioned, um, with the, if the nitrogen is a reaction type. So let's say why the oxygen concentration deplete? Again, the same way, if you apply all these chemicals, fertilizers, surface water, everything come in, you, you have algae will grow. Bacteria will consume. That algae will grow because they have lots of nutrients. And the way the algae grow, algae itself will not consume, decrease oxygen because algae is the photosynthesis. They actually drive up the oxygen concentrations and because they, they emit oxygen. But what they do is that they, they grow so much that they, dip, they, de, they die quickly. And when they die, these are lots of biomass and those biomass is degraded uh, by the bacteria in the system. So as algae go, their dead biomass is decomposed by bacteria and those bio bacteria need oxygen. So not only they takes up all the oxygen produced by algae, they'll also consume everything else that's remain in the system. Uh, so that means actual dissolved oxygen concentrations in water will be so low. That's why fish cannot breathe. That's why you die, uh, we die, uh, not we, uh, the fish die. So as you see, the oxygen amount required for different types of fish is different. Uh, if you think of oxygen requirement, uh, 14, 13, 12, 11, so it's just different range. As you see, bacteria require very small amount of oxygen. This is where they can survive. As you go a little higher and higher, these are the fish that uh, bottom feeders means they stay near the sediment, so they don't need that much oxygen. But if you go higher and higher, think of salmon. Salmon really need fresh water. And uh, they, they require um, almost 100% saturation of uh, water. So that means if you too much organic there, they will not survive, they will die. Same thing, brush, crab, you know, the carp, those are a little less uh, other things that you can think of. So now how much, you know, we talk about the concentration of oxygen is up to here. Well, what's, why don't we think that no, there'll be hundreds of milligram per liter of oxygen. Uh, why just say uh, 14? Why don't we go all the way higher? Well, there is a limit how much oxygen that can present in water. That's based on atmospheric oxygen. So you have oxygen in atmosphere, they dissolve in water. And so there is a fixed amount of oxygen in, in atmosphere. That's 21% of 21% uh, um, of, uh, of atmosphere is oxygen. So that means 0 0.2 atmospheric pressure. Okay. So if you think of what is all that means in the concentrations, uh, moles per, per volume of, uh, so you can write that PV equal to NRT. Uh, temperatures, R is a gas constant, N is the moles. So that means concentration, which is moles per volume of air, would be P by RT. Okay. So the pressure is given 0 0.21 atmosphere, R constant you can put, you can put the temperatures, and then that means you now you can calculate the concentrations of oxygen. Uh, what is the maximum concentration of oxygen in water that can be possible? So at 20 degrees Celsius, the maximum amount of oxygen in water is around 9.1 milligram per liter in at the sea level. Okay. So now you ask this question: 9.1 is the reason, but why these others are higher? Well, that depends on temperature, as I said, 20 degrees Celsius. If you have lower and lower temperature, um, more and more oxygen will dissolve. Uh, uh, because if you see the, uh, the temperature is at inversely proportional, so if you increase temperatures, the oxygen will escape into atmosphere. Uh, so the cold water, the, if you think of trout, salmon, they like cold temperature. That's why you, know, you see the oxygen concentration is a little bit higher because the regions have lower temperatures. So what I just mentioned is basically using uh, Henry constant, you can calculate how much water, uh, how much oxygen concentration in water. As I just show you what is the concentration in air by PV, this is in air, okay? This is volume of air, this is mole. Um, 
So once you know the concentration in air, you can calculate in uh, water if you know the, the partitioning coefficient or Henry law constant. So this is given for oxygen, it's written here. What it does, it, 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 uh, it creates a thermodynamic forcing of how much amount can be dissolved because it's balanced between how much in oxygen in water versus air. So if you plug those value, you should be able to calculate in water. And as I said, at normal one atmospheric pressures and 20, 25 degrees Celsius, this oxygen in water would be 9.1 milligram per liter. As you decrease temperatures, more oxygen, more oxygen will dissolve. Um, same thing with, uh, as you uh, as you increase pressure, you have to think of you know what will happen there. But normally we the pressure doesn't vary a lot, so usually what we look for is actually temperatures. Um, so again, example questions: What would be the saturation concentration of oxygen in rivers in winter when the air temperature is zero degrees Celsius? If the Henry constant of the at these temperatures is zero point two eight times 10 to the 3 moles per liter atmosphere. So Henry constant, I just put this one, is 2.28 minus 3 mole per liters. And then at the bottom also atmosphere. OK, I just write this one. So just by looking at the unit, you will be able to say what is this ratio means. Henry constant is the ratio of concentration of oxygen in water to air or air to water. But based on the way it is written here, if you see moles per liter, liter is a volume of water. So that means this is the concentration of oxygen in water divided by concentration of oxygen in air because atmosphere and the denominators. If it is unitless, it is usually said what is the ratio, what the form, what is numerator and denominator. Uh, so now question is, what would be the concentration of oxygen in, uh, what would be the answer be in, in uh, okay, so the answer is, what is the concentration of oxygen in water, in milligram per liters? So again, if you know, yes. Isn't, isn't like ox, the concentration of oxygen of air over oxygen of water? Like on the previous slide, wasn't that? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, so Henry constant, as you see, it can be written in both different way. It could be ratio of air to water, or it can be just decide as oxygen in water. So there is no, it's just a fraction. Mm -hmm. So you can write either way. And you can see the units are different based on how the notations are. So for instance, here atmosphere at the bottom, that means it's water to air. If you look at this column, this is air versus water because the atmosphere in the top. So you can choose which one you use. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now that we know this one, all you have to do is calculate oxygen concentration in water. That's what asked. So that will be Henry Constant's time um, oxygen in air. And as I said, oxygen in air is 0 0.2 atmosphere. So I'm going to write 2.28 minus 3 mole per liter of water uh, by atmosphere. But TM. And then the, the Henry constant, this is Henry constant. Oxygen concentration in air is 0 0.21 atmosphere. So the TM, the TM cancels. Uh, so that all you got is uh, some number uh, in moles per liters. But now I ask you in, in a milligram per liter. So whatever that number is, if you multiply 0 0.2 times whatever that number, so I'm just going to write here 0 0.21 times 2.28 minus 3. Okay. So you have moles per liter, but you have to calculate in milligram per liter. So first of all, you have to change moles to gram. Um, so I'm just going to write that one mole. Um, so one mole of oxygen. Uh, so just know that this is not oxygen atom, oxygen gas. Oxygen gas means two oxygen. Okay. So one oxygen is 16 gram per mole. So that means 20, uh, 32 gram per mole. 
okay so that means one mole of oxygen would be 32 gram of oxygen and but we are we ask milligram so that means one gram of oxygen or anything would be 1000 milligram of same thing so that that things cancel out so that would be because this thousand will take that minus three out so that will be 32 times 0 0.21 times 2.28 milligram per liter because gram gram cancel mole mole cancel so only thing that remain is milligram per liter so every time i ask a question based on the, if you know the henry constants and the atmospheric oxygen concentration is always constant you should be able to calculate uh, what is that in water any questions of on dissolved oxygen all right so now these are all theory or the things that you uh, no, but now it's our consequence of the lower dissolved oxygen. It's called biochemical oxygen demand. Again, oxygen demand is not same as oxygen concentrations. Oxygen. So uh, when I write OD, that means think of chemicals. 32 in the last slide. So uh, some question was, I didn't missing 32 in the last slide. So there is a 32 here. Um, see yeah it's there um okay so um biochemical oxygen demand so that means you know the amount of oxygen required by microorganisms to oxidize organic waste um organic or inorganic here you know so that's a um, uh, that's a bod and as i said there are two types of bod uh, it's a carbonaceous and a nitrogenous Carbonaceous means, you know, the amount of stuffs that require oxygen. Uh, so let's say this is your waste. That could be organic. That could be nitrite. That could be ammonia. Okay? It could be anything. It's a mix of all the stuffs in water. What it does, it microorganism. Microorganism will take oxygen from water. So whatever the inside the water that, that you just calculate, they take from that oxygen and they, they combine, they breathe in that oxygen and use this uh, organic waste and they produce CO2. If it is a no 2 this will produce nitrate. Uh, sometimes they can produce nitrogen gas. If it is an S3, they can also produce nitrate. So anyway, so that's the thing and then the plus some organic might left behind, or some or it can also produce energy. So that's why they degrade, because that's why we eat food. And it's also produce biomass, means the bacteria also grow. Now they will multiply, they will have their children, so that's how it goes. So this is the whole idea. So this is called oxygen demand, okay? BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. And this is the DO. A dissolved amount of oxygen remaining after this is being reacted. So just the concept here. Um, so what is the maximum amount of oxygen demand possible for a system? So that's you can calculate based on a redox reaction, something you already did without realizing. So this is another example. So theoretical oxygen demand is basically the stoichiometry. Uh, so for instance, if I ask what is the theoretical oxygen demand for ammonia, if you know the amount of ammonia, then you can calculate based on this. So for ammonia, NS3 uh, it, uh, need two oxygen to becomes, let's say why it is two oxygen. Um, ammonia, the nitrates, then it becomes water. Uh, then you have a three, okay, so it's already balanced. So I just want to write this one out. Um, so it need two oxygen. For here, this is also a balanced reaction. Whatever that organic or glucose is, it need three, six oxygen, like you did before based on redox. Uh, it, it requires six moles for one mole of that organic. So already you know that how to solve this thing. So let's solve it again. What is the theoretical oxygen demand of one liter of water containing 1.7 gram of ammonia and 18 gram of glucose based on the reaction given below? 
and it says molecular weight of ammonia and this one uh, the glucose is 17 and 118 gram the reason molecular weight is given is because you are asked to calculate oxygen so you are asked to calculate oxygen amount and oxygen amount is a function of ammonia amount and glucose c6 s12 or 6 but you these are the things in moles okay moles of oxygen required is based on the moles of uh, ammonia they are present but i asked the cal question to do in term, but i gave you i didn't give you moles of ammonia i gave you the mass of ammonia so that means i gave you the gram of the substance so you have to change gram to mole using molecular weight once you know the moles moles in a, uh, then you can convert that to equivalent of oxygen and then you convert oxygen to gram or milligram okay, using molecular weight of oxygen okay so let's do that one so amount of oxygen required okay whatever the amount of ammonia in moles you see one mole of ammonia require two moles of oxygen so that means every one mole you have to count oxygen will be twice as much ammonia present plus if you think of whatever the concentration is 6 6 s12 or 6 whatever the mole is amount is you need six times more of that mole uh, um, for for the amount of oxygen needed so for instance that's why i wrote amount of oxygen needed is twice as much ammonia present as well as six times as much as uh, glucose present because of this stoichiometry okay so now let's calculate that uh, ammonia is 1.7 gram of ammonia then you have to calculate how much mole well 17 gram of ammonia is one mole of ammonia okay same thing glucose you have 18 gram of glucose i'm just writing glucose and you know that 180 gram of glucose is here molecular weight is same as one mole of glucose so what I did here is that I instead of you can add mass to mass, you have to change to mol, moles. So I change everything to mole, and then this is the factor based on stoichiometry. So if you put this one, you got a numbers, and you got moles of oxygen per liter of, uh, or because it's already given one liter, so liter of water. So you, all you have to change is to multiply uh, milligram. So one mole of oxygen is 32 gram of oxygen and one gram of anything is thousand milligram of anything so if you put that value you should be able to get the amount of oxygen so that's how you can calculate maximum theoretical oxygen demand that means this much of amount of oxygen required to consume all the nitrates and these things present in water any question Okay, so now you know how to calculate theoretically. Um, as I said, um, does just because you have theoretical calculation doesn't mean that you will have all that available for degradations. The reason is, think of plastics. If you put a plastic bottles in, in water and you are saying how much amount of oxygen required, well, microorganism cannot degrade that even though that's there. If you burn, if you catch fire on that, and that's how they can consume oxygen from atmosphere. So it has really oxygen demand. Theoretically, it can consume oxygen uh, if you just oxidize it by at high temperatures, but doesn't mean that it will actually happen biochemically in water. Uh, so, so what they come up with this idea is oxidations are the ultimate BOD, means how much ultimately actually practically you need. Uh, so that's always less than the theoretical oxygen demand. Thus, the reason is there'll be always some organic or contaminants 
that cannot be degraded by by microorganism. So that's why BOD um, ultimate is always less or equal to theoretical oxygen demand. That's more like a practical answers. Um, so let me see. There is too much sun here. Let me close. It. Okay, so um, that's just the no, the concept. And now question is, how do you measure BOD? Well, this is something, you know, if you if you get into entry level position in an environmental engineering firm, they're gonna monitor water systems in different wastewater treatment plants, as well as uh, sometimes let's say LA river. Uh, so what you do is they will give you some water. They will say, collect some water samples from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, from the locations and what you do is you you mix that with a seed solutions. Seed solution means basically you're measuring the dissolved oxygen concentrations. So the idea here is that you have a solutions, you put in a bottles and you measure the DO now, whatever the amount, and you measure the DO after let's say five days. So the difference in DO is the amount of BOD consumed in five days because in, that DO decreases because somebody just destroyed that uh, DO by coming, uh, consuming that uh, amount of beauty. So if you know that dissolved oxygen change in five days, you can calculate how much of those chemical must be destroyed for that DO to deplete. And then if you know those in five days, how much changes, you can calculate, extrapolate that uh, total amount of beauty in that water. Uh, so you need some kind of modeling for that. So this is what happened. You normally what you do is, um, a lot of times microorganism is may not be present in the waste. So you create a seed solutions where you have, uh, because for degradation of organic, you just not need just the chemicals. You also need some extra nutrients because uh, bacteria just doesn't need that uh, organic food. They also need iron, all that other stuff. So you add some kind of seed solution, which doesn't require any, uh, which is not a BOD consuming substance. And then let's say you have certain volume of seed solutions and then you add small amount of waste in it. And then you mix them together and you measure the solution DO that day and after a certain time, okay? Uh, so here basically five days is people do. Um, if you ask why five days, we'll get to know, but think of the reason you can wait longer. If you wait longer, then obviously you should be able to get more accurate calculations, but the reason people use five days is kind of practical as well as some theoretical. I will learn the theoretical, but practical means, you know, weekdays is five days. So the idea here is that you collect samples and you wait for five days um, to, uh, so you, that's how people come up, um, that's convenient. The same thing you'll know that there is less interference if you do within five days. If you do it too quickly, uh, maybe the dissolved oxygen concentration will not deplete enough to get to a number. So that's why people find five numbers. Okay. The idea of BOD5 is you measure DO concentrations initially, and you measure DO concentration after five days, and the, you divide it by the, the dilution factor, because you didn't have the entire bottle filled with waste. You, you dilute them with the seed solutions. That's why you have to make um, the actual dilution factor, uh, because you, what you calculate DO is actually entire bottles mixed with the, the, the seed solutions. Uh, so you have to account for, if you didn't have diluted, how much it would have been. And here you are assuming the seed solution itself is not depleting oxygen, it's only the waste. And the challenge here is that there is a limitation of this measurement. You cannot measure this one, or the number is not accurate if your concentration already depleted a lot. For instance, if it becomes less than the final concentration become less than two milligram per liter, but that's the sensitivity of this method. That means you don't know whether uh, it might be at the limit, it could have decreased much more because bacteria are not very efficient as if it become uh, low oxygen level, uh, they cannot find that oxygen. So that's why a lot of times you have to make sure that the oxygen concentration, the final is above two milligram per liter. Uh, so if you if you have really concentrated waste, if DO decreases, it might be underestimating uh, if it is less than two milligram, because that means it just didn't have enough resource. So seed solution is basically you take the waste, you add, let's say 10 ml of uh, waste you have collected uh, from wastewater treatment plant. Seed solution is basically a standard solution which has already nutrients for bacteria to do that reactions. 
So it's basically clean water and those some powder that nutrients you add in that mix them together and you pour into this uh, bottles and we fill it all the way 300 ml because you don't want any head space because that head space will have oxygen because you, have, you don't want to have any extra oxygen so you fill up completely for that and uh, airtight so again seed sol seeded dilute uh, solutions means basically the the clean water with some nutrients for bacteria to consume that oxygen uh, or degrade that um, organics so this is the formula. Dilution factor is basically is a function of how what's the ratio you mix them together. So let's say solve example. Then you will see this one. A 10 ml of a sample sewage mixed with enough water to fill that 300 ml bottle has an initial DO9 milligram per liter. So that's the starting point. T equal to zero. Um, your DO or DO initial was let me solve. DO initial is nine milligram per liter. At t equal to five days. Accuracy it is desirable to have at least two milligram per liter drop in DO between the five days run, and the final DO should be two milligram. So, this says DO final is two milligram per liter. For what range of BOD5 would the dilution produce the, um, uh, the final DO is two? For what range of BOD5 would this dilution produce the desired result? Um, so your dilution is what? You add 10 ml of waste, uh, 10 ml of waste, and you fill that to 300 ml. So that means your dilution factor or P is the total, while the waste into the what's the final volume it becomes 300 volume so that means you won over 300 it will be 0. Um, so 1 over 30 so that will 1 over 3 0. 0.3 so this will be 0. 0.33 okay if you want to measure the bod5 as you see this unit is this bod5 is initial do initial minus do final so that will be 9 and 9 minus 2 uh, milligram per liters divided by 0 0.033. You get a number. So that's the, what does that mean? If this is the amount of chemicals milligram per, consumed to, to consume this much amount of oxygen. So this is the amount of oxygen demand. Okay. So this is again equivalent of chemical, but the unit is milligram liter of oxygen. Okay. Demand means this is the amount of oxygen needed. But what is referred to is the chemicals. So if you see, uh, it is a first order reactions. Um, uh, that means you know initially the reaction will be uh, the concentration will decrease very fast. As the concentration decrease first, that means the amount of ox the BOD remaining in the system will be uh, or amount of organic oxidizers will going to go higher and higher. So the amount remaining will be less and less. Again, reiterate, oxygen demand is not as dissolved oxygen, okay? Um, and DOD five days is DOT zero minus DO five days. So the models people use to solve this problem is uh, the first order reactions and LT is basically organic, okay? So BOD, amount of BOD or oxygen demand chemicals, uh, that's the notations. LT means the amount of oxygen demanding substance remain in the system after that T time. Okay, so it's again first order reaction DL by DT equal to minus KLT. The reason is um, this is a first order, so that means uh, D by DT is um, is uh, is KLT. Okay, that's that's the first order reaction which is written here. And if you solve it like we solved any other reaction, you get exponential form. Uh, what that means is your amount of BOD or, uh, or oxygen demanding chemicals remain in the system is a function of what you start with is the amount of oxygen demanding substance initiated initially, and then um, exponential K times T is the time elapsed. Uh, so a lot of time people, because you really don't know the initial amount because you take the waste, you don't know the initial amount. 
that's the amount in, in, in fat you have to calculate. All you do remember is what consumed in five days. So that means what is the initial amount is what is consumed in that five day of test or the one of the test, testing time plus what's the remaining amount, okay? Uh, so that's equal to the initial amount. And this amount would be basically L0 minus what is the initial amount minus what is the remaining amount must be the things that is consumed in five days or the time. So if you substitute LT, L0 minus LT would be this, L0 into minus KT, you get the formula. Why it is important? Because this is what you measure in that BOD5 test. Basically BOD5 is L0, one minus with the minus K times five. Because your K is in terms of one over day, usually day inverse. So what is that mean? Is if you measure BOD5, what is the amount consumed in five days, you'll be able to calculate what is the actual um, ultimate oxygen demand in that substance without really uh, extrapolating it. Um, so this is how the, you can use model. So if I gave you BOD5 and I calculate, ask you what is the ultimate BOD, you can just use these equations. And But you have to know how many days I did the test. So again, this is just to show initially you have high oxygen demand as you, dec as you deplete that chemical, so there is no remaining system, it's a bad system. So it is decrease, decreasing. So that means amount of chemicals remaining to consume oxygen will decrease. I have a question about the previous slide. Yeah. On the top where it says uh, deal, uh, that's supposed to be negative, right? When it says oh, equal- Yes, yes, you're right, right. It's the same equation as here. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Because it decreases with time, that's a negative sign. Again, it's the same thing I say, this is a, just a graphical term, you know, amount of, uh, uh, so think of this is ultimate BOD that consumed, this is the amount utilized, it will increase over time, and after the point, this is the five days or whatever the test you do, five days will be here, and after some random time T is here, then after a point, it becomes close to that, the idea here is that you never reach that ultimate amount because there'll be always some organic text ever to degrade. Um, but this is how you can graphically represent. Okay, so now that you know the concept, let's solve this problem so that you know how to solve it. The dilution factor P for an unseeded mixture of waste and water is 0 0.03. So same thing that we just calculated. So this is P. Uh, the DO of the mixture is initially nine milligrams. So that means I gave you DO initial is nine milligram per liter. After five days, so again, I'm asking DO final, but I gave you T equal to five days. Um, the, it dropped to three milligram per liter. Again, this is above the threshold, two milligram per liter. That means this test is, is reliable. The reaction rate constant K has been found to be 0 0.2 uh, day inverse. So that means K is given 0 0.22 day. What is the five day POD of the waste? Uh, so what I'm asking is POD five, okay? So POD five, as you see from the previous equations is this, okay? How much, what I'm saying is how much, biological oxygen demand or chem oxygen demanding chemical consumed in five days. If not, what is the remaining after the five days? So that is L0, one minus E to the minus K T. Okay. Um, but first thing you have to do is you have to calculate the, uh, the L0. Uh, what would be the ultimate carbon oxygen demand, all that stuff. So, so this is L0, this is BOD5. What would be the remaining amount uh, after five days? So that will be LT. So it, in terms of notation, this is what it is being asked, okay? So first thing you have to do, if you, if you, if you want to calculate this, you need to know this one or either way. So let's see how much BOD consumed in five days. So as I said, 
This is same as this one. Let me just erase this volume because that's basically also do initial minus do final divided by uh, the dilution factor p. So this is initial is um, nine minus final is three divided by 0 0.03 um, in milligram per liter. So that means this is the amount consumed in five days. Okay, so BOD5. B, you know that BOD5 is a, um, it's basically here, BOD5 is this value. So I can write here zero is BOD, let's not write this one. BOD T divided by one minus zero minus KT. Okay. So L zero is BOD five one minus zero minus KT is five here. Okay. So that would be uh, this is the six divided by zero point zero three. So that number would be six divided by zero point zero three. So that's two hundred. 200, yes, thank you. So 200 milligram per liter, one minus into the minus, K is 0 0.22 per day, and time is five days you wait, so that means it's five days. So whatever that number is, okay, this will be, uh, the idea here, this will be a lot more than that number, that 200, so it will be a lot higher than 200 here because this is only consumed. So that means what is initial is the what's consumed plus what's remaining. So it will be higher than 200. Whatever that number is, you write in milligram per liter. The third one, what would be the remaining oxygen demand after five days? Um, so that means I'm asking LT. So LT is L0 e to the minus KT. So L0, you know the value here, minus K is, 0 0.22 per day times five. Again, it's going to be milligram per liter. That's the amount of remaining after five days. Any question here? Okay, so these are all building up to that one problem that you want to solve is a, is a how much amount of BOD in a river when it's discharged. Uh, this is just to give you uh, some idea that the K, K is the reaction rate or the, the BOD consumption rate. It depends on a couple of factors. This could be a quiz question. Is uh, what it depends on. I gave you three, three or four, four different answers and you have to choose uh, the one which is uh, correct or which is incorrect. I will tell you that in that quiz. Uh, just know that this rate of de degradations depends on the organic quality. For instance, plastic will take forever, whereas if you add a simple sugar, it will dec decompose very quickly. So that means it depends on organic carbon type. It also depends on mic microorganism type. Not all microorganism is capable of degrading everything. So what type of microorganism present is also detect on K. But overall, you will not know those things in a waste. You will not detect those things. What you know is a bulk number. What's the controllable factor for you is the temperatures. If you increase the temperatures, it decompose much faster. Uh, so that's why if you in the summer temperatures, in the summer time, eutrophication is much higher because it's warm, they're decomposing much faster. So that means it's going to be more eutrophications. So that temperature relationship is here. And I gave you here at 20 degrees Celsius, and you can convert that to any different temperature. So use this number K value in this table if I gave you the wastewater is a different temperature, you can calculate. For instance, K equal to five degrees Celsius, you can calculate whatever the K20 for our switch is the number times um, the, the, the theta, theta uh, uh, the T minus 20, T is the temperatures. Okay, so let's see the, the, the calculations. Uh, in the waste has ultimate BOD is 300 milligram per liter. So at 20 degrees Celsius, the five day BOD was 200 milligram per liter. So that means uh, BOD five is 200 milligram per liter. Um, BOD 
ultimate is the total amount of BOD. So that's the BOD L0, okay, is 300 milligrams per liter and temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. That's here. The reaction rate constant K is 0 0.22 per day. What would be five day BOD if the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius? Well, we just put, plug the value here, you know. So I I would say that just this one because we have few, few minutes remaining. Uh, just solve that, putting that equations there. Just take the example problem there and that way you'll be able to uh, calculate that value. Um, let's see. Okay, again, uh, these are all different definitions, uh, chemical oxygen demand, theoreticals, BOD5, what is consumed in five days, uh, BOD ultimate, same as L0, and then chemical oxygen demand is uh, basically chemical, it's nothing to do with the bacteria. It's just burning oxygen is chemical oxygen demand, or burning ether. One of the concept questions. Can I ask you Any questions? Yeah. Well, what is the theta? Okay. So that's the ratio. Let me see. Just to, last time I gave you a wrong answer, so I don't want to give this time. So let me just quickly check. So if you open the textbook, chapter five, it is on the, the, the uh, Take all the so the, the reaction rate constant. That's the what's the value? One point zero seven. That's usually given to you at some point. So that would be the table for it. So usually sometimes you write E, that's uh, E to the arc T, but this one theta, it's uh, basically constant is 10. So that value is one, one point. Zero four seven. That's something you. It is given uh, notations. That's a function of somewhat temperature dependent, but um, that that is a um, that is a um, empirically determined. So, for all of your question, you just have to assume this is zero point one point zero four seven. Okay. Yeah, it's a temperature dependent dependent term. It's just that basically what it means is. Kt by K20 is some arbitrary number divided part to the power minus 20. So this one is usually empirically determined by log functions. So if you do ln, that would be ln Kt ln 20 is T minus 20, okay? So this is how um, uh, okay, if it is exponential, obviously, so that theta, so this will be log, hold on, times log ln theta. And this is ex this is empirically determined. So what you do is you, you plot kt by 20 zero uh, in, in a one axis, then you'll be able to find that value. Or if you plot this, so it's this, um, this is the temperature versus this value, you'll be able to, uh, Y intercept will be ln theta. So that's the empirical term that's determined by 1.047. Okay, so I'm just gonna write it here just in case. Okay, so this is the last questions in terms of the concept and, and rest of the class I'll record it later. Um, or after the class, I'll just give you the concept behind it now. 
Uh, so you see BOD5 is the amount of oxygen. If you see y-axis oxygen demand, x-axis is the time. BOD5 is basically you're measuring what happens to the first five days. But doesn't mean that in five days you capture everything that can be destroyed. In fact, the actual amount can actually go higher. And you see nitrogen BOD, nitrogen, nitrogenous biochemical oxygen demand, in fact, start after five days. The reason is nitrogen BOD is basically bacteria consuming nitrites or ammonia, NS3. So this NS3 and NO2 is not very energetic for bacteria. They don't really need to use this one because it's not very, it's like if you have a desert, you are not going to eat something which is not that tasty. That's the same thing for them. They will not get to nitrites or ammonia unless they, um, unless they have consumed some of the initial amount of BOD or organic. And sometimes those organic also produce nitrite and nitrite because many organic or proteins Protein has NH2. So when you decompose those BOD, uh, they are also producing ammonia. So that's why all those things will start after like those around certain time. So when you add total BOD, it becomes like higher. So one of the things you have to remember here is that nitrogen, so nitrogenous BOD didn't start until like, there is a lag time for nitrogen BOD versus chem carbonaceous BOD, this is CBOD, okay? And that's because CBOD is more favorable for bacteria to consume for energy than the nitrogenous. Once they're consuming those initial very nice organics, they will go to that uh, nitrate. Um, so that's why, you know, again, this is the reason I said why it is five days, because you don't want to account for the nitrate nitrites initially, because they just take longer. Any question on that? So the quiz question here can be you now, which one comes first? Is this a COBOD or the nitrogenous BOD? And what could be the possible reason? And the possible reason I just say that is because it's, uh, uh, it's easier to degrade some organic uh, or it's energetically favorable for them to degrade those organic first compared to the nitrates or ammonia. And second, uh, those nitrates and ammonia may be not present there, but they produce when they decompose those organic like proteins. Let's just see the proteins are like this. If you see, this is the um, this is the uh, uh, this is the proteins uh, functional group. So this produce as an NH3, NH3 in a reaction when the organic decomposes. Uh, so I'll leave it here just to explain what's that. What I'm going to explain in the recording video. You learn everything basic concept, now you are gonna apply that. The idea here is that waste is coming in. That waste when it's consumed, we have very nice dissolved oxygen. This is like uh, saturations. So fish are healthy and happy. The moment you dump this, ox this uh, waste water here, which has lots of organic, the oxygen concentration will start decreasing. The reason it start decreasing is because you have the oxygen and the, the chemicals mixing with water and those those bacteria will consume those things, like in the bottles. So as you go far, farther and further, the reaction takes time. It is, it's like batch is moving, it's like a block flow reactor. So you know the K and you know the initial amount, you are just, or uh, that is L0, and you are calculating LT, amount of BOD remaining in the system. So that means oxygen concentration also equivalent to decrease because you are consuming those. So it will continue, continue that batch. At some point, it will hit to the really bottom because at that point, you have consumed most of the, um, the organic things that need to be consumed. At that point, there is not just enough remaining. So that means all the time, the oxygen is coming in from atmosphere and some are degrading. Uh, so the resulted amount would be always a very small amount because you have to, after this point, there is nothing left to consume oxygen. So that means the concentration will increase because the atmosphere is continue to, oxygen is dissolving inside. So it will continue to rise and then it will go back to the level. And why it is important? Because you want to know what's the lowest concentration it can achieve. Because that will tell what kind of organism will survive in those conditions, which fish will die. And another thing you have to uh, calculate is the how far it is going to happen. 
because if you know how far it's going to happen you can know that these are the zone where you don't have any fish uh, or you this is the in, impaired area uh, so a lot of times you have to calculate these concentrations what is the lowest concentration so this is do critical and uh, this is distance criticals or another way is time critical if you know the velocity of a velocity of a, a stream you divide that velocity then you get the time that means how many day how long after that batch will become that uh, because this is a, like a flow flow reactors so if you know the t tc tt is time bc is you get the distance from that locations so all you are going to do now is calculating these values based on what we already know and that's the mass balance so what i'm going to do is i'm going to explain that i'll uh, just the concept there are a couple of terms here one is the like you have a bad system like a dumping waste that bats move in the river the do is decreasing because of bod consumption and then you have reoxygenations because atmospheric oxygen is also coming at the same time so the net amount of oxygen is based on how much you consume because of the um, bod reaction and how much oxygen get into the system so that's written here rate of oxygen concentrations is is a uh, basically um, uh, net amount of reactions happens and all that so we am um, again as you see there are multiple examples is given here that's the final answers these are not you have to derive but this equation will be there for you to solve uh, so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to record this last five or six slides after the class and update it because it has multiple example and also why i want to do it is because the midterm question one long question is on this class particularly so you have multiple example i gave this is one examples in the ex and this is another examples for you to solve and this particular one also another example this is the midterm question as you can see that i asked in uh, 2018 uh, so it will take me a while for to record this one in the sense uh, definitely i will exceed the class time but i'll give this multiple example and um, to solve this one you just have to uh, write those equations you you learn the concept you already know mass balance so i'll do the exact mass balance which you have done so many times uh, but all you have to remember is these equations and this plug the value get the answer um, so i'll record that later after this class i'll end it here um, just know that i'll record from here 31 to the rest of the slides are record and i will not solve every questions in the slides because i want you to try those i'll solve only one question so that you know how to solve it use it and the rest of them you'll solve on your own or ask those questions on, on campus where as well as to ta again this is very important class because this is one long question in your um, midterms so you got to know how to solve bod questions all right so any any questions after this you know we'll uh, we'll uh, i'll stop recording professor yes can i ask you one more question about the graphic that you showed earlier about the effect of oxygen demand wastes on okay the um so you mentioned that the goal is if you can calculate how far the the um oxygen demand travels no, sorry the yes the oxygen is depleted yes okay how, so if you can calculate how far that travels downstream yeah what is it that you can deduce from that i i didn't quite catch that second half of your explanation okay so first of all if you have higher amount of waste what will happen this the 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 concentration the deep the sag curve it will be more deeper that means you have very small amount of oxygen at that locations okay and the second thing is how far it goes it's also determine what's the extent of area this waste is going to be affecting because you have a river and let's say there is a there is a there is a community living 10 miles from here 
okay uh, so you want to know where you want to design the wastewater treatment discharge point so that it, the water level or the do level will come back by the time you go to the next uh, community who actually use that water uh, or the, the use for some recreation so that's why you know the where you position this one how far from the community is what you determine by this distance okay so this okay. is the this is the impaired sections so you want to put it as far as possible for the community so that you should be able to um, not affect it okay that makes a lot of sense thank you and also the concentration was the bod l0 that you were discharge so that the the lowest concentration that you achieve it should be not harmful for something that you care about okay so these are the two applications for everything we know again this this curve what we plot here is the mass balance calculations uh, you did that so many times i'm going to show it which is already shown in the book uh, so if you read it you will understand everything uh, so again if i don't even cover anything that's already a mass balance you just apply the same mass balance concept to calculate these values and again for the exams you are not going to solve every every steps you're not going to write all the mass balance setup and do all this uh, is already set it up for you all you have to do is just use the equations and that's exactly what's going to happen for from now on i'll just set up the example example so what is in what is out what is the reaction all that and write the equations and then i'll say you don't have to solve this is the final solutions uh, that's what you are going to copy for your um, questions so again these are repeat of what we already know uh, in terms of concept but you are just applying in the real world now Uh, can you go over the Henry's law uh, example again? Okay. Um, um, I just kind of wanted to see your work again. Uh, I think on okay. the previous slide you had the the oxygen concentration of air over the concentration uh, oxygen concentration in water. Okay. But uh, if I notice, if I maybe I saw something incorrectly, but I think it was like flipped upside down. Yeah, so on the example problem on the following slide. Let me see where the Henry constant. So Henry constant is is a is a ratio of concentration of uh, that particular gas in water to air or air to water. It could be any. You can reverse that, but the number will change. So that's why the unit that's here is given. Uh, you have to pay attention to what unit is given. And based on that, okay. you will be able to find that whether it's a ratio of air to water. It's very easy to find where is the atmosphere term is because atmosphere is the concentration in air. If it is at the bottom, that means a ratio as a water to air. So that's how when I read the question here, you see a TM is at the bottom because it's a liter. The way it is written here is kind of confusing, more liter atmosphere. So that means this is this is must be air because you don't measure concentration of in water as atmosphere and this must be the concentration in water so if the atmosphere the unit is on the numerator then you know this is air to water okay thank you any other question okay so I, I, uh, so next class, next class, the way we are going to solve uh, is you learn all these topics and next class will learn everything about groundwater. So what you learn here now is all surface water. Those polluted contaminants will infiltrate into subsurface and get to groundwater. And that, that's where you want to know how much those contaminants will travel before it feeds that groundwater pumping well, drinking water well. So there you learn the concept of how contaminants interact with soil and how to design the remediation system based on those factors. We'll not get into remediations, but at least we'll learn the concept of contaminant transport in groundwater. So we, again, we solve surface water. We only focus on um, uh, focus on um, the, the river water and also particular type of pollutant. Um, there are lakes. I didn't focus on that, um, but you can read it if you want to know it's something that you are interested, but now it's not part of the class. Next class, groundwater. The following class will be engineering design, like how to design drinking water treatment systems. So um, 
after that, I think uh, wastewater and that's all about midterms. So uh, I think up to lecture, if I if I see the, if you go to the uh, midterms, let's see, syllabus and grade. Um, if you see uh, week four is surface water groundwater and the week five is water treatment systems and principle. Uh, week six is the wastewater treatment plants, but your midterms will be up to week five, okay? So everything we cover this week and next week is all included in the midterms up to that week, week five. Week six will be wastewater treatment plant. That's not part of the midterms. Uh, that will go to the, the finals. And again, this, uh, this class is not cumulative. That means everything you learn up to midterms is part of the midterms. Everything we cover after the midterms will be part of the finals. At class, that was a long question. Short question, some concept are repeated. So you might get some similar question as before midterms, but you know what those are, okay? Uh, there are some question here. What is the theta equation? Okay, we saw, we said it. After today's lectures, would you be able to answer all homework questions? So the homework question I put it there is nothing to do with this class. Okay. So you should be able to answer those homework question based on last week lecture, not about this lecture. So everything I put in homework three is based on the last week lecture. So you don't need this one for the for the, the homework which is released. The homework which will be released on this Friday will be based on what we covered today and to, on Wednesday, okay? So you should be able to do that. Again, I, I, didn't, I didn't answer many questions on the uh, on campus where I'm going to answer those. I'll get to those now. Again, work early on the homework. You should be able to solve those. And there are two questions on the homework which is your ideas, your thinking about environmental engineering. So you can write anything what you feel. There is no right wrong answer. I just want to see what you care more, okay? And it doesn't have to be one page. It could be just one small paragraph. Okay, just write whatever you think, you know, um, that way. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna stop recording.